Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Corelli. Tonight's episode, to be honest, isn't going to be as fun as last week's. We did have a great time with Melissa, but I think this episode is going to be one that's not only important, but it is going to be eye opening. Tonight's topic is one that some people, maybe up to this point, some of you listeners would consider this conspiracy theory or exaggerated. However, I think after you hear the story of Cheyenne, it may open your eyes to some of the evils that exist in our world. Before we get to this letter, I wanted to just give you some information about what's going on here at the Freedom from the Struggle podcast, as well as the Struggle series. We've been discussing that I have decided to put my book series on a separate podcast in story format to allow some of you to gather that content without having to go out and buy a book. So wherever you listen to this podcast, you can start listening right now to the first book entitled The Struggle by going to The Struggle series on your podcast app and just looking for the same logo that we use for the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. And so there's uh, several chapters that are already downloaded, and this week we'll be dumping probably just close to the entirety of book one onto that podcast. Once book one has been downloaded, then we will immediately start downloading book two every week to give it to you in an episode format. So right now, you could go back and binge listen to the beginning of book one entitled The Struggle, and maybe by the end of the week, you might be able to listen to that entire book. And then starting next week and following, we'll be releasing the second book called The Sacrifice in story format, one chapter weekly until we complete that. Once we get that done, then we're going to move to downloading book three entitled The Return and so on and so forth. And as I said last week, who knows? As I continue to write, we may take the adventures of Pastor Anthony Corelli and his ministry team going forward onto new adventures. So just stick around for that. Again, you can find that podcast by going to the Struggle Series on your podcast application in the search bar, and then just look for the same logo a uh, similar logo anyway that we use for the Freedom from the Struggle podcast because I did use the cover of book 1 as the logo for this podcast Freedom from the Struggle so it should look very similar now with that being said always remember that we love to grow this podcast because we want to reach out to as many people as we can not in an effort to grow the podcast and become world famous but just as a way for this little ministry to be one that is available to those who may not reach out for traditional help when it comes to spiritual warfare or demonic attack. And so if you are somebody who knows somebody who is struggling, or you yourself are struggling, feel free to reach out to us by contacting, contacting us excuse me, via email, anthony at thestruggleseries.com, and start a preliminary conversation with our team. We do read each and every letter. And we'll reach out to you if that's what you'd like us to do. And if you simply have a letter like tonight's guest, we'll consider reading it on the air as an effort to not only help you, but to help others as well. So with that being said, I want to jump right into this letter from a woman named Cheyenne. And if you're not familiar with this podcast, I might read a little bit. I may stop in the middle of the letter, and then we're going to try to give some commentary at the end. So bear with me as we get to this letter in its entirety. And that's actually not true. I'm going to leave part of it out, but let's get to that in a second. Hello, Anthony. I just recently found your podcast and have listened to all of season one and a few episodes from season two. I should be caught up soon. To be honest, I stumbled upon it by accident and was very curious of the format. I thought that it may just another I excuse me. I thought it may just be another program glorifying demons. Then I listened and realized that that is not true at all. 
It is the opposite. I loved your breakdown of your theories in season one. It is refreshing and not common theory when it comes to mainstream thinking. With that being said, what you believe is the most accurate. How do I know? I know because I grew up in a satanic cult and I know a lot about the subject. So let's pause here and think about that. This woman is calling in and she stumbled upon this podcast on accident, thinking that it may just be a podcast where they're glorifying demons or maybe not taking this topic seriously. And I, I don't take it as too big of a compliment. I think she's just trying to communicate that she's not saying that I'm, I'm great because my theories are accurate. I think what she's saying is, is she knows that my theories might be on the right track because she grew up in a cult and she knows about this stuff. And for people that know about this stuff, they know that what we say here doesn't just come from some fantasy land. Now let's continue. I am writing you because I have a story that may help some of your listeners to understand just how much evil is hidden within our culture. I want to start by saying that what I am saying, yeah, okay, let me start say that again. I want to start out by saying that what I am saying is absolutely true and that I'm not giving you my last name because I may be in danger if I am discovered. Then again, I have always lived a life looking over my shoulder. Wow. Okay, let's keep going. I will just get to the point. I grew up in a house where my parents were Satanists. I am not saying that in any metaphorical sense. They worshiped Satan and were very evil people. I get so sick and tired of people trying to make excuses for the different beliefs about worshiping Satan and the variations of groups that claim Satanism in their name. If they aren't on the side of Jesus, they are on the opposite side. I heard you mention that in one of your episodes, and I was happy to hear that you believe the same. And yes, Cheyenne, I do believe the same. You know, I, I don't ever set out to offend people, but telling the truth sometimes becomes offensive. We do get a lot of correspondence here where people will say that I'm lumping all occult activity into one title or one label and that I'm simply ignorant and don't understand that there are some sects or, you know, uh, groups that are occultish, but they are not evil and that they are good, including white witches, good witches uh, and, and things like that, Cheyenne. But I do agree with you. In reality, the Bible says, if you're not for me, you're against me. And so they may consider what they're doing benign or considering what they're doing to be not traditional Satan worship and therefore not evil. But I can tell you that your desire to pursue witchcraft and gain power is an evil pursuit. And I've said this before, and I'll say it a thousand times, even though this does offend some people. I have prayed for many witches and warlocks and occult people who got in over their heads. And I can assure you that they all tell me the same thing, that they thought this was something they could control. Now, I am giving credit in the fact that I believe that some of this stuff is true and effective. What I think Cheyenne and I are saying is, is that of course it's effective because it's fed by evil, not by good, even if you're putting it under the guise of good and not evil. And yes, there are people that would say, well, Anton LaVey didn't really believe in Satan. He was just more anti-Bible or anti-God. Well, think of how ridiculous that is. If you're anti-God, then you're opposed to God, and therefore you're choosing the other side of what God is. Now, if you want to argue that my God is evil and, you know, your God is good, then, you know, don't even go there because the reality of it is, is that you're choosing to, to be opposed to God, which in and of itself is evil. I actually believe that people who at least take a stand are at least standing up for something, even though it may be something that's wrong versus people that are saying, 
I don't really stand for one God, but I'm just opposed to that God. See how that kind of doesn't add up and it doesn't make sense. And so again, if you're listening to this podcast, you may disagree. And I hope that you hear my heart, that it's not my goal to shun you or to pick a fight with you, but it's simply to say that in our belief system as Christians, we believe that if you are not for God, you are against him because that's what he says. And there are many people that when you, uh, who say, well, I'm a Satanist, but I don't actually worship Satan. And I want you to think not only how confusing that is, but it is also kind of contradictory to, to what you're trying to get across. And it's not only confusing, but I think it's in error. But let's keep going with the letter. She says, anyway, my parents belong to a larger group of Satanists who all practice under secrecy. Most people who met them would never knew that they were literal monsters. Your listeners would be shocked if they realized just how many people they meet are like my parents. They would be amazed. They are doctors, lawyers, school teachers, and the like. They just function in society and no one seems to notice. They are good at hiding in plain sight. You know, that, that reminds me of, a, of something I said a couple of episodes ago, and I'm going to say it again. This week, just for example, I got a text from my doctor and I hadn't seen her in a while and I'm getting older and, you know, I have a lot of different aches and pains. I lived a pretty rough life in my past. And so it's definitely catching up with me. So for the last couple of years, I've seen her quite a bit, but recently I felt pretty good and didn't really need to go to the doctor. But my doctor texted me just to see how I was doing. And we had a discussion and in the discussion, She uses the phrases like, praise God, I'll be praying for you, you know, I'll continue to pray for your health, that type of thing. Now, how many Christians actually have a doctor who is a Christian? Now, this might be a little controversial, but I want you to hear me out. The doctor is the person, your personal doctor is the person who you trust with your health. And I think many of us are so blinded by their degree on the wall or their profession that we don't really take the time to know who our doctor is. I am so blessed to have a doctor who out of the blue reached out to me to tell me she was praying about me or praying for me and thinking about me and my health. I guarantee you, I am in the very, very, very small percentage of people on earth that have a doctor like that. And more importantly, why don't we all have a doctor like that? And what Cheyenne is saying here, that she personally knows that some of these people are doctors or lawyers or professionals. If you're a Christian listening right now, Does it ever dawn on you that your child's school teacher may actually be worshiping Satan? And that is the person that you send your child to every day. And if that is true, and you don't think that person is subtly influencing your child, you're crazy. How many of you don't realize that your doctor is not only not like my doctor, they are opposite of my doctor, that they believe that they are godlike because they don't worship God, they worship Satan, and that they're about obtaining power, they may actually be manipulating you or trying to drain you of power through their Satanistic rituals and spells, curses, if you will. How many of you got a divorce attorney when you were going through the most difficult time in your life and didn't stop to check, is this person a Christian or do they delight in the destruction of a marriage in the nuclear family? Think about that for a second, because what Cheyenne is saying is that these people are everywhere 
and they just function in society, like she says, and no one notices because we don't take the time to know people like we used to. You know, my brain goes back to like maybe the old West where there was a, you know, a small town and there was a doctor who basically practiced out of his home and he would, you know, either bring you to his place or most of the time would do a house visit. You know, somebody would get on their horse and ride out to his property and they would come and get him and he would jump on his horse and ride back to your place and he would try to help you with whatever was ailing you. But I want you to think of this. People also saw that doctor in church every Sunday. And people in the town knew who went to church and who didn't. And people in that town knew who were non-church going people and people who were at the brothels or the bars. And, you know, maybe there was too much judgment in some cases, but for the most part, you would know if your doctor was a believer or not. And, you know, if your doctor would say, well, you know, let's pray about this and I'll see you at church on Sunday, then you would have an idea of who you were dealing with. But if your doctor wasn't in church on Sunday, then you would at least know that you needed your spiritual health met somewhere else and your physical health was unfortunately left into the hands of an unbeliever, so you could at least pray for that as you were praying for God to intervene through this doctor, even if the doctor wasn't a believer. So again, these people are hiding in plain sight. Let's continue with Cheyenne's letter. My parents practice many dark rituals. Let's just say that people actually get sacrificed. Now, when I read this earlier, I, I paused like I just did now. Now, we're going to get into parts of this letter that I've chosen to, to edit, maybe is a good word, but this was just simply written in the sentence exactly as I read it. And I am somebody who has performed deliverance ministry, you know, prayed deliverance over people for decades and decades. And I have heard of things and I have been privy to many conversations and done seminars and in Bible college and seminary and things like that, but they were usually very minimal. But I have always been somebody who believes that people actually do get sacrificed. Now, this is often considered conspiracy theory in today's day and age. And there's, you know, multiple, I guess, groups or factions that are discussing right now in the world that there's things like adrenochrome where people will actually harm children and harvest this adrenalized blood into some rituals and consume it to gain youth or power or whatever. Now, Sometimes I'm asked if I believe that that's true, and here's where it's going to get a little tricky. I don't know specifically anything about that. I've never been privy to anybody who I know who has, you know, actually participated in that because they obviously wouldn't tell you, and I've never been privy to somebody who knows about it because if it is true, they may not be around. But it almost seems to me like Cheyenne is alluding to this in a kind of covert way, because I do believe that there are ancient sacrifices that have been passed down for centuries and millennia by demons who, if you read in the Bible, required human sacrifice. They required bloodshed. And I want you to think in your, in your mind. And like one of the things that pops in my head is like maybe the Mayan culture Maybe we've seen a movie or we've heard something where the Mayans would take people up to this big altar kind of in this pyramid structure, and these priests would sacrifice people for their blood. Well, what did they do with that blood? Think about it. I think in our minds, we simply believed that it was just shed and that was it. 
But I don't think we really know if there was actually consumption as part of the ritual. And as I've studied demons and, and the Nephilim and a lot of these concepts that you've heard me talk about for these, especially through season one and even through season two, I think what we're realizing is, is that a lot of these blood sexual sacrifices are how people obtained these relationship with demons, including maybe some of the people in the Bible who became Nephilim-like creatures, like Nimrod, or maybe like Esau, who was this hairy man. How did they obtain that? How did they become something different? You know, we heard that Esau became Edom, and that's where the Edomites come from. Well, why was his name changed? And it kind of makes sense when you think that God also changed people's names for ministry, but maybe these demons had somebody's name changed when they chose to follow, to use a, a, a Star Wars term, the dark side. And so I want you to think about what these sacrifices and rituals are really trying to obtain. They're trying to obtain power and maybe even become possessed intentionally to gain the power of the demons themselves. And some people may even say that they become integrated with these demons and become these awful creatures or awful human beings. Because the Bible does say that the Nephilim were there before the flood and then after. And so, you know, when you read through the Bible and you hear that God sent his chosen people through Canaan to conquer all of these lands, to give the land back to these Hebrew people, it wasn't just because God wanted them to have the best, you know, soil to till or the best geography to live in. It was symbolic of God taking back that land that he had gave them originally from these Nephilim descendants who had perverted or compromised mankind. And so it was symbolic of a re-gifting of this chosen land for God's chosen people. But I digress. Let's get back to the letter. She says again, my parents practice many dark rituals. Let's just say that people actually get sacrificed. I don't want to say too much, but I believe that is true. I have never seen it myself, but I have heard them talk about it. They would come home from events, and she has that in quotes, and they would be excited that it occurred, claiming that, claiming that it was giving them power. As for me, I left home at age 16 and never looked back. I am not sure how hard they looked for me, to be honest, but I have changed my name and live in a place they would never look for me. For the record, my real name is not Cheyenne, but that's what I go by now. My whole identity is hidden. I don't have social media, and I changed my name formally several years ago so that I have no attachment to them. I often wonder if they have done their homework to at least know I changed my name. I have moved several times and now live a very secluded life. I sometimes get angry about living like this, but I don't ever want to get complacent. I have kept my mouth shut because I don't trust anybody. I am always concerned that if I try to talk, one of their members may be in a position of authority and help them to cover it up, or worse, cover me up. Ouch. I think we all know what she means by that. I've told my husband, and I don't really talk about it to anyone else. He is basically the only person I trust. When I was young, I was part of this ring of children that were passed around for the gratification of others. I overheard my parents talking about it one day, saying that they started their child, which is me, in the activities when I was a toddler. How sick is that? When I was older and asked them why they did this, they told me that it was an honor to be used by Satan in these rituals. Wow. There is a lot to unpack here. What I want you to kind of think of is when it comes to the mindset of somebody who would 
consider it an honor to, I guess, for lack of a better word, donate your children to some grotesque, evil, sick cause. You don't really value the life of a child. And I think, you know, I've always, I don't want to be hypocritical here because I do believe that, you know, when we start to categorize sin, we're trying to do God's job for him. And God forgives a multitude of sins, um, you know, if we ask for forgiveness. But on our human level, of course, we would say that giving your kids over to this type of just disgusting practices is is as evil as we can comprehend. And as I hear her talk about this, the next paragraph, actually the next two paragraphs, go into some very graphic descriptions of what happened. Now, I don't want to be somebody who shies away from controversy. I'm not trying to pick fights, but I'm also not trying to avoid them. But on the same token, I think that I have to kind of make decisions every now and then where maybe something is just too much information. And I think maybe our imaginations at this point would do us enough good to move forward. But in these next two paragraphs, she graphically describes the things that happen to these children in these rituals. And they are nauseating. That isn't even a good enough word. I don't know what the word would be. It's disturbing beyond comprehension. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to be somebody who, who doesn't give you all of the details, but I think in this case, you can, you can probably assume what the details were. And it's just too much, too graphic for for us to consider it even effective in the letter. I think the letter in and of itself is doing the job. But I'll kind of continue on the third paragraph of the description. She said, they put us kids in, our, in rooms of houses, secluded lodges, or even the woods. I can tell you the memories that come, flood, or I'm sorry, I can't tell you the memories that come flooding in from time to time. Okay, let me say that again. I can tell you, I can't tell you that the memories come flooding in from time to time. Um, I think I think I'm there might be a spelling error there. Let me just start that over. They put us kids in rooms of houses, secluded lodges, or even the woods. I can't tell you the memories that come flooding in from time to time. Oh, I get it. So she's saying that you, it's hard to even describe. If I focus too long, I will go insane. The people involved use children because it is some sort of an ancient ritual that has been used for centuries to summon demons and draw power from them. When you speak of these demons being ancient, they are. Humans have passed down the secret knowledge throughout the generations, so they keep their agenda going. You did an episode where you talked about how people after the flood we're still doing rituals to become Nephilim. That is when I knew you were the real deal. That is basically what they are doing. Now, again, let me pause here. So she's describing that these, these rituals go on in these secluded places. You know, I'm sure people's homes where, you know, it's a very secret thing, but out in the woods in lodges or even in the woods themselves. And, you know, you can hear, that she's saying that the memories come flooding in from time to time. If she focuses too long, um, she'll go insane. And I can imagine, and you know, I've read the previous two paragraphs of this and it makes me want to be insane. And I didn't even go through it. I would say that I am somebody who was the victim of abuse as a child, but it is so much a fraction of what this poor woman went through that I won't even compare it. It's not even in the same ballpark. Now, she goes on to say that these are ancient rituals, and this is what I want you to really understand from this letter, and I believe this is what Cheyenne is trying to communicate. 
You've heard me say in previous episodes that there are so many things in our culture that have just become normal, but they do stem from rituals. And, and I want you to understand that when these watchers, these group of angels that descended from heaven by command of God to teach mankind about him and about how to foster life on earth, these watchers were accused of giving too much knowledge or giving knowledge that God didn't really want us to have. But because these angels are very intelligent, higher level beings, they're aware of how certain rituals and certain things in the universe work, even beyond what we would consider physics or physically possible. Physics doesn't always explain things that are, of course, supernatural. And so that's why very scientific minded people can't grasp that a satanic ritual or witchcraft could actually be effective because it defies the laws of physics. But if you were an ancient heavenly being that was built to be knowledgeable in many ways of the universe that humans were not, they, these angels were able to come to earth and teach us things. And I always use the example of like metallurgy. You know, when you hear scientists discuss the fact that at a certain point in history, humans were using, you know, stone chisels to make things. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere in the scientific record or the geological record, these people were using, you know, metals, alloys. How did they go from not even knowing how to spell metal to be able to merging metals to make stronger tools that came from this knowledge, this, this knowledge beyond human comprehension. And so these rituals are passed down. And and I use these examples every year we have our kids sit in front of a cake with a bunch of candles on it. And we tell them, to blow out the candles and make a wish. Stop and think about what I'm saying. That is a ritual. That is a ritual that comes from witchcraft. Another example I've used in the past, knock on wood. You're saying something, you don't want it to come true. So you knock on wood. That is a ritual. So if those little rituals have been merged into the collective consciousness of mankind, you can imagine what other ancient rituals people have no idea about, except these group of people that that are basically knowledged in a way that that has been kept secret from the rest of us. I'm going to tell you a little story. And again, these are stories that you can believe it or not, but you know, I would say maybe uh, a decade ago, maybe 11, 12 years ago, I met a man who claimed to be a Mason, a Freemason. And I was curious because I I've had some, friends of mine that don't always like my theories on masonry because this this man that I knew from my past claimed to be a Christian but then was into a lot of these masonic rituals and so him and I had debated so when I met this man I'm telling the story about right now he was willing to answer some of my questions and he said you know I'm a Christian too but I have to be honest that at the level that I am I'm starting to see that there's more non-Christian stuff, and I'm paraphrasing here, than what I originally thought and was originally taught to me. He goes, but I am privy to a lot of information that would blow your mind. And me, probably like you, being inquisitive, said, 
um, give me an example. And we happened to be at a friend's house who had one of those older televisions, like with the tubes, not with the, you know, flat screen. And even, you know, 11, 12 years ago, there were still flat screens. I, I can't remember even before then, when the last time I had saw like an old, what they used to call, I think, bubble television. But we just happened to be, you know, where, where this guy had a bubble TV. And this guy said, you know, turn that TV on. So we turned the TV on. And once the TV was warmed up, it was set on some channel. And the, the TV actually worked to like with the rabbit ears and everything. And it was real fuzzy. And, you know, you almost are astonished that that's how we used to watch television when you have LED pictures and stuff. Even, you know, 12 years ago, there was still flat screen. So he said, now, is that channel coming in? I said, well, that's the best it's going to do. I mean, it wasn't really staticky. It was just kind of blurry almost because we're so used to a brighter picture. So we kind of debated that for a while. Then he said, now watch this. And he kind of began to do this kind of hum, almost like a chant, almost like mm, something like that. And as he got this frequency, I guess, coming from his, his diaphragm or whatever, the TV started to static. And then he stopped and the TV went back to normal. Well, I instantly started to look at his hands or to look and see, you know, if this was, they were like tricking me, if was there somebody else in the room, but there wasn't. And so he duplicated this, I don't know, six or seven times on command. And I can look you all in the face if you were in front of me and say, this is a real story and this happened and there is something to this frequency thing. I'm a very educated guy, very intelligent, and I have zero explanation for this and honestly wouldn't know where to look. I'm sure that there are people that are into physics and frequencies and understand that type of stuff that I'm just not educated in that might be able to give you some answer and maybe able to, if he was willing, test him and find the frequency that he was duplicating with his with his vocal cords or his diaphragm or wherever it was coming from that could then probably prove to you that at that frequency it alters a signal but where did he learn that from and so i have no doubt that he learned it in some sort of masonic type of ritual or teaching and that's very mundane at least you know what could they do with that? I don't know. But if that's true, then so many more things that we don't understand are also true. And so as she writes in her letter that I'm always talking about the Nephilim and how there was, there was a resurgent of the resurgence of the Nephilim after the flood, I believe that this was done through rituals. It is possible that the, another group of angels descended from heaven and duplicated the process, but I don't really think that's how it worked. I think there was enough people on that ark that there was maybe somebody who knew about those rituals. And if not, it is very easy to understand that the Nephilim, which have now died in the flood, but their spirits are cursed to roam the earth, were able to communicate to these humans through the same means that they use now to infiltrate our lives, you know, cause us, you know, to, to consider to stumble. Then we make the choice and we open a door and these, these demons were able to communicate to us. And once they built a channel that they can communicate, they taught us these rituals. And then we continued to pass them down because remember as a Christian, you're not born inherently with the, with the knowledge of the Bible in your head. You might be born with a love, a love for God or a desire to know him, but you don't know the Bible. How is it taught to you? It's taught through teachings. It's taught through guidance in, you know, finding certain literature that you can read and learn on your own. 
it's taught through liturgy in some churches, which means it's like a ritualistic way to learn about God. So the very same thing would occur in the opposite direction. So if you are into witchcraft or Satanism, this is information that has been passed down for centuries, just like Christianity has. And so, yes, I believe that a lot of these rituals that these Satan worshipers follow is designed to help them gain power in this world for whatever their own selfish purposes are, even to the point where they're blinded to the fact that they're subjecting their children to the most heinous of crimes. I mean, you, you start to wonder, like, what is going on with the person who could do that? And then when you say, well, they're demonized, they're possessed, then it makes sense. Now, let's continue. She says, these people have evil agendas. They honestly believe that Christians are suckers because we live meek lives. We live meek lives, not weak, but meek. They brag on the power given by the demons and think we are missing out. Funny though, they don't believe that God doesn't exist. They know he does. What is even funnier is that they make fun of atheists just as much as Christians. They also brag that they get atheists riled up to torment Christians. They consider them the biggest suckers of all. Now, this caught my attention, and you know, I know that when I know something, I'm not afraid to put it out there, but I also try to live as somebody who, when I don't know something, I'm going to admit that. And I think this letter just taught me something when I read it a few days ago and just taught me something again as I read it the second time. It says they brag that they used atheists to to rile up or they rile up atheists to torment Christians. Now, That makes sense to me because you've heard me talk over the last handful of weeks about these so-called atheists that attack Christians. And even, you know, last week and, and so on and so forth, you've heard me talk about how even other pastors, especially those who do deliverance, are are there's like a certain terminology that they all use, all of these you know, quote unquote, atheists that are so triggered when they hear Christians talking about demons or deliverance or even God in general, that they like have to say something. They have to, they have to like react. But here's the thing. If you are not a Christian or you don't believe that God even exists, why would you be so riled up? And I never considered that these Satan worshipers might actually be putting out the propaganda that gets gets these atheists to go after Christians so they don't have to. So if I create some propaganda that I put out onto the internet and that the that's going to draw the attention of these atheists and they start to learn this terminology and get riled up, then they go out and use that to attack Christians, that would be an amazing ploy of these Satan worshipers. I think you would agree with that. Now, she says, when I left home at 16, I went to live with a friend. Her parents actually hid me. My friend told her parents and they believed me. They are Christians and they prayed hard about what to do. They swore that they would even go to jail if my parents ever sent the cops to look for me. Now, man, that, That like stirs up my emotion because I think like legally you could look in that and say, this is like maybe a form of like kidnapping or at least harboring kind of a, a a fugitive child. I don't know what you would call it, a runaway, I guess. But these Christian people made a decision that they say was out of prayer that they would even be willing to go to jail to keep these people from finding her. And what also strikes me is that some of you would say, well, why didn't they call the police? Well, 
I think you're going to find out more, but as she continues on in this letter, she continues to tell us that these people are hidden in plain sight. And I think the the Christian family that took her in had to believe that if they called the police, what would they do? Was there enough evidence that they could prosecute this child? What would have happened with the child? Would she have gone to another relative? I don't have enough information to know if the relatives were involved in this as well. So these Christian people with the limited information that I have made a decision that I I would have to believe that the Holy Spirit prompted them to do to hide this child. Because again, she says they swore that they would even go to jail if my parents ever sent the cops to look for me. They even made a hiding place in their home. Crazy thing is, my parents never looked for me, at least not that I know of. I grew up and changed my last name at age 18. I first changed my name legally, then I got married and changed it again about six months later. I actually married my friend's brother, and she has in quotes here, the family that took me in. So her friend's family took her in, and somewhere she fell in love with the brother you know, one of the children of these parents that took her in. And she says, we have been married ever since. He is an amazing man of God. He is my protector. This kind of chokes me up a little bit. She says, he is an amazing man of God. He is my protector. I feel so safe when he's around. I have told him everything, every disgusting detail. He never once looked at me with disgust. He adores me, and I consider him a blessing. I follow Jesus and am so in love with God and his mercy. I won't lie, for the first few years, demons would attack me. I had several attachments and was tormented. I had sleep paralysis at least weekly. I would be physically attacked when I was awake. And I'm going to continue here, then I'll break this down. Finally, my friend's dad found a guy who came by the house and prayed deliverance over me. Anthony, the whole family saw black smoke come out of my mouth three times as the demons were leaving. I heard one of your guests say the same thing, so I know he is telling the truth. He prayed for me for six hours. When it was over, I could tell that I was free. Now, again, let me stop here. This woman is saying that she had these attachments, and and I'm going to tell you that that is to be expected if you didn't gather that already. When these evil people were abusing this child, they were putting these attachments onto her. I don't think we realize that sexual abuse is a form of evil that we can actually have the demons become attached to our victims. And, you know, you think about sin in general. When we sin against somebody, we don't consider it like we're cursing them. We're cursing them with this burden, if anything. But she is saying that she had these attachments, and I don't doubt it. It doesn't sound to me like, if you want to put it in human terms, this girl ever had a chance. She wasn't being taught about God, and it doesn't appear that she was willing to worship Satan like her parents were, so she didn't really welcome these attachments as somebody whose own sin was causing the attachment. These are the sins of others. These are the demons that not only prompted that sin, but then through that sin attached to this poor child. And that's terrible. Now, this family that she lived with is amazing, and I wish I knew who they were, and I won't be able to know because this letter includes the fact that we'll never speak again. And I respect that. But think of this this family that the, the father goes out and finds a deliverance minister because they obviously knew what she was dealing with. And I would imagine that they heard her screaming in the middle of the night. They 
they were having conversations with her about what she was going through with this sleep paralysis and so on and so forth. And so for six hours of prayer, he was able to help her find freedom from her struggle. Now she continues, I don't want this letter to get too long. So here's what I want your listeners to know. This stuff is real. There are really groups of people out there that worship Satan and have been given ancient knowledge about how to gain power from the demons. My dad used to be able to con people by controlling their minds. Him and my mom would sit at the kitchen table and laugh at how he took people's money and other property so easily. There is a scheme in play to usher in the Antichrist. Anthony, what you talk about on this podcast is true. These seem to be the end times, and Bible prophecy seems to be in process of being fulfilled. I know that if we all turn to God, he will save us. If you are on the fence, please don't wait too long. There is a war going on right now for our souls. Just turn to Jesus, and he will accept you just as you are. Anthony, I found a great church, and we have a great pastor. Unfortunately, no one in the church knows my story. Here is why. Many of these Satanists go to churches to pray on weak people. Again, I'm going to pause here. Because she's talking about this scheme and the Antichrist spirit being on the earth right now, which we have talked about on this podcast and actively believe. And I believe we are in the end times 100%. Now, I'm not saying I can predict when that's going to be because the Bible says that no one will know the the day and the hour. And so when I see a lot of these people trying to guess, I, I wonder how much even that becomes sinful because you're never going to know for sure. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to at least know the signs of the times, which I respect. But as part of that, I believe that we start to see what she says in the next paragraph, which is these Satanists go to churches to pray on weak people. They try to join groups and events and pretend to be followers. Can you, can you wrap your head around that for a second? If you are an active church goer, a church attender, did it ever dawn on you that some of the people in that church are fake, that they are actually false, and they are there to prey on weak people by pretending to be something they're not to get into your life? Think about that. She says they are there to lead people astray. Like I said earlier, I lived a secluded life and will not disclose. I am always afraid that if I speak up, it may get around the church. If one of these evil people is in the church, they may tell the larger group and I may be discovered. Man, I cannot tell you how this part of this letter hit me in the face. This woman is so scared. Not that she's living a scared life necessarily, but she's maybe so intelligent and so aware that she understands that if she were to tell her story, that this story would obviously make it around the church. Because if you were in a large group of a few hundred people and somebody said, you see that girl over there? Her parents were Satanists and they used to pass her around and she had all these attachments and they had to send a minister to pray deliverance over her. You don't think that would become a rumor? You don't think that would become, you know, common knowledge in the church? And if one of these people was in this church, they may have connections to the larger group, which would draw attention to her and may cause them to research her and figure out who she is. And if the church is afraid that she's going to talk, Who knows what could happen to her? So I'm glad she has people to talk to, especially her husband, which seems to be the one person that knows every detail, because she can't really even ever put her story out there. You see, if I'm a church and I tell my testimony, I don't have something from my past that I would wonder would cause people to come looking for me 
I mean, I trust me, I have things in my past that if people knew I might be shunned or ridiculed or, or judged, but there's nobody actively looking for me. If you understand what I'm saying. So she has to live her life wondering where these evil people are and to try not to be discovered and at the same time live free from the demonic attachments that were, that were on her. So she continues, I instead try to live going forward. I have a good life and God has blessed me. I thank him every day for saving me from my horrible past. I also thank him that I was an only child. And man, again, that hits me in the face. Because you can hear her thoughts that, thank God there wasn't more of us because I would have left and that other child would still be there. Or she may have had to make a decision to take her younger sibling and run like she did. That's crazy to me. That is crazy. She says, thanks for reading my letter. You are welcome to use it on your show, and I hope that it speaks to others. Unfortunately, I will not be available for any more questions. I have to protect myself and my family. I hope you all understand. Cheyenne. Now again, this letter is heavy, and it is one that I think people will either accept or deny. But I'm, I'm going to give you a thought before we get the deniers too far down their path. What benefit would this woman get of writing this letter? She's not giving me her full name. There's not enough information in here for anybody to know who she is to gain any sort of attention. There is literally no benefit in disclosing this letter level of information. She has no idea and will probably hear this on the podcast and maybe even be frustrated at me that I left out some of the detail. But if her goal was to get that detail out there, I, even I'm not going to give that to her. But I see zero benefit of her writing in this letter unless there's something true to it. Now, if she gave her first and last name and wanted her city and state represented and wanted to call in and do the interview so people could hear her voice, because no offense, I would have interviewed her, no problem. I would have definitely welcomed that. But this is an anonymous letter, basically, from a woman who used to be named something else and now who goes by Cheyenne with no last name presented. There's no benefit here. She's writing this letter because it's true. And I believe it's true because I believe that these worshipers of Satan have been passing down ancient knowledge forever. I also believe that that is why hundreds of thousands of children go missing a year, just in the United States. You know, I don't even know the numbers worldwide. I just know it's enormous. They go missing and never to be seen again. When I was young, they used to put their pictures on milk cartons. Now it's, you know, signs and Amber Alerts and internet searches. And even on social media, you'll see a picture come through that a child is missing. But if we're honest, we look at it, we say that's sad. And then we flip the game on and watch, you know, a sporting event or a, or a game show or something. We don't sit there and get in our vehicles and go look for these children. We say how sad it is and we move on. And unfortunately, we have no idea how many of these children are never found. And not just children, but adults as well. And at some point, even rational thinkers who don't believe in God or the devil have to at least be honest with themselves and say, well, whether I believe in evil or not, or Satanism or not, there has to be a certain percentage, maybe a large percentage of these children that go missing because these people took them for evil purposes. I mean, you, you have to, at some point, say, these can't just be random psychos that snatch up kids. And there's so many of this, so many of these people working with no attachment to any other larger groups. There's just 
let's just say a hundred thousand people a year, a hundred thousand children go missing from, let's say a certain country. Are we saying that a hundred thousand psychopaths individually decided to abduct a hundred thousand children from that specific country? That kind of doesn't even make sense. But what makes perfect sense, or maybe at least makes more sense, is the fact that there is a network of people that are purposely trying to abduct children for a purpose. That actually makes more sense. And now we're hearing stories of human trafficking and what happens to people, and we're starting to become aware, like even the, even the movie Taken with Liam Neeson, where he goes and rescues his daughter from this human trafficking ring, you know, and, and, you know, the story's amazing because this one guy with this quote unquote particular set of skills goes and finds his kid. And all of us men watch that and wish we were that tough, but you know, in reality, we would have got shot, you know, in the first scene, but we would at least try because we love our children, right? Well, that movie was telling us a story. There's movies like Sound of Freedom that have actually told true stories of people that actually go to these places to rescue children. And if you've never seen the movie Sound of Freedom, I not only recommend it, I would say that it's a mandatory watch for all of us, even if it's uncomfortable, because it brings light to the fact that these things happen. And, you know, in these movies, you may not always see that these, these kids or these women are abducted into these places, you know, as human trafficking or sex trafficking as part of a satanic cult. But can you at least acknowledge that there's Satan behind the purpose of these people getting abducted, even if the, the abductors are simply trafficking these women? That's not of God. And even if you are somebody who is an atheist, that's a level of evil that maybe you aren't even capable of and you don't believe in good and evil. Or you at least don't believe in the source. But even you would be disgusted with the fact that there are people that are so evil that, you know, an atheist who has no consequences for their behavior because they don't believe in any of this quote unquote mumbo jumbo, there's even something in you that says, but we don't go that far, but these people do. So to me, that's proof that there is evil because the source has to be so vile that it's influencing people to go well beyond what even godless people would do. And so I thank Cheyenne for writing this letter and exposing that these things really exist. And Cheyenne, I think you're brave. I think you gave us just enough information for us to discuss the topic, but definitely enough to keep yourself safe and not go too far because your safety is more important than anything. And what you've gone through Um, survivor isn't even an adequate enough term for you. You're like a warrior. You're like a, like a, a light in the darkness and, and God's love for you is so evident that he would go into the darkest places to find, find you and bring you to the light and praise God for this family that you married into praise God for this friend that you were able to trust enough with the details and thank God that he gave you the courage and the motivation to write this letter because this little podcast is going to reach a certain group of people, but then these people are going to reach other people and other people. And it becomes not about the podcast, but it becomes about our understanding of evil in the world. And so Cheyenne, thank you for your part in that. And as a listener, I want you to consider this and I want you to think about maybe on a, on a deeper level or maybe even on a more surface level, depending on where you are, of what evil exists in the world right now that we overlook or we bypass. Because it's everywhere. You know, the way we treat people, the way that we interact, even customer service, you know, there's no decency, there's no, you know, friendliness. You know, it's just, everybody just treats everybody rudely. And then if you respond to the rudeness, then you become the problem. Like I said, 
evil has become good and good has become evil. Even little things, subtle things like that exist right in front of your, right under your noses. We have a music industry that literally broadcasts Satanism in videos and in concerts. And 40,000 people are watching these things in an arena. A, a woman or a, or a male artist doing a satanic ritual on the stage and you're sending your children, paying two $300 a ticket to send your children to be, to be part of a satanic ritual. And you don't even know it. I listened to a, a video, I think a couple of weeks ago, where a guy said a band called Panic at the Disco, he didn't realize, you know, he just went there with his teenage daughter and kind of sat away from her and her friends so he wasn't the weird dad. But he was sitting a few rows back and was watching these people do these crazy satanic, you know, things during their concert. And the name of the band wouldn't have given it away. And he showed pictures of symbolism on the stage. And, and, and it was just like, this stuff is everywhere. And so as a listener, I want you to just do, do some homework for me. And, you know, nobody likes to get homework, but look around your world and see what you haven't been seeing. And the reason I say that is because not only in your prayer life is this going to matter, but it may also prompt you to look for the people that are wrapped up in this. I've, all, I've often said that it breaks my heart that sometimes the thing between God knowing somebody and somebody knowing Jesus and not knowing Jesus is a self-righteous Christian. Let me say that again. Sometimes the difference between somebody meeting Jesus and not meeting Jesus is the Christian who doesn't represent Jesus well. But the opposite can also be true. Sometimes that person may know a loving Jesus that they've been looking for because you are an adequate or an excellent representation of who Jesus is. That's what I aspire to be. And trust me, I fail often. Sometimes I catch myself failing and I just want to punch myself, but you know, I drive around with the Jesus sticker on the back of my truck window. And then when I'm cussing somebody out on the road, I have to remember that I just misrepresented him. But I hope that more often than not, I can just be kind and compassionate and introduce somebody to Jesus in a way that they haven't known him before. And the only reason I can be motivated to do that is because I know the devil is also after their soul. And I want as many people as possible to be sitting in heaven with me as we enjoy a heaven that is beyond our comprehension in the presence of our God. I don't want people to not be there. And that's where my motivation comes from is because I understand what evil is because it's worked in my life. And now I see it work in the lives of others. So I want to say a quick prayer for us before we go today. And again, thank you, Cheyenne, for your letter. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this topic that was brought to us because it reminds us that we can't just take our faith in you for granted. There are so many people caught in the throes of evil, and many of those people don't have a way out because this is being perpetrated by the people that they're that are supposed to love them, people they're supposed to be able to trust. And so, God, I pray for freedom for any people that might be stuck in this situation. I pray that you shield us from evil when we don't even see it approaching or we don't even see it active in our lives. I pray that you would open our eyes, that you would allow us to see what the devil wants to do to us, what these demons are trying to do so we can turn to you and have you shield us from these attacks. God, I love you so much for what you saved me from. And I confess my sin that I sometimes take that for granted or sometimes get caught up in myself. But I thank you that you always remind me, gently remind me, 
where I've come from and where I am now. And I only pray for myself and others that we would just continue to grow in our relationship with you. And God, for anyone listening who doesn't know you, I just ask that you hear their prayers right now. That if they want to know you, that you would meet them right where they are. That as they cry out to you, God, forgive me of my sin, please come into my life and save me, that you would meet them right in that place, right in that moment, and become tangible to them. Become their Savior, like you became mine, when I didn't deserve it. And God, I pray so much for lost people. I pray for people who are struggling with spiritual warfare. I pray that they would find the help they need in you through people, through podcasts like this or churches or even just their Christian friend. I pray that you would just draw as many to you as you can. I thank you that you're a God that goes out and finds the one and leaves the 99 behind because we're that valuable to you. Thank you again, Jesus, for being a savior, being somebody who would die on a cross for sin, sickness, and death. And I pray that that same Jesus, the Jesus that died for us, would be the Jesus that saves us right now in our mess. And it's Jesus in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the Freedom from the Struggle podcast once again. If you don't mind, please like, subscribe, set your alerts so you can uh, find out about new episodes. Give us a rate and review if you don't mind. And always, like I say, the most important is share this with a friend. We hope to see you next week. Thanks for joining us. And may God bless you and bring you peace.